<laughs> oh man, look at it. it looks beautiful there. The sky's all blue. May we should do this every year. <laughs> <laughs> I've been cycling in the English countryside <laughs> with no cars on the road, and it's like I created my. It's like I created it with my mind. It feels, I would think being in the UK a bit would, might feel a bit like 28 days later, though. That'd be my only concern. Yeah, the, it, in London, I believe it is like that. But it has been like that for years. So. <laughs> 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 With the pandemic. I mean, that's a, that's a fair point, yeah. But yeah, I think, being, I think it's funny because I think this whole thing is sort of justifying like a general stand-up comedian lifestyle anyways now, which is kind of nice. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've not noticed much of a difference myself. I I do miss performing, though. There, there's been a lot of times my wife has just rolled her eyes with the, would, would this be funny? Would this, come here. <laughs> Doing a fight type five to the kid. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what's weird about Paw Patrol? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I found, I found some uh, some holes in the plot, but he's not interested. <laughs> I just, I don't see how Chase is possibly in that scenario, and that whole city just gives all the, uh, uh, like, control to this child and their dogs. I just, I don't know, I'm just saying. Yeah, wouldn't <laughs> happen. Wouldn't happen. Um, so what, how have you, but I mean, how have you been faring overall? Have you been, you feel like you're getting into, like, at least, like, you're reading more, watching more TV, getting into anything like that? Uh, yeah, definitely watching more, uh, television. Um, I've got a book on my iPad, but I rarely read it. Um, but, uh, cycling, um, one of the, like, and, um, I didn't know the, uh, strength of this decision, but when we moved to Canada, we kept all our stuff in a, um, in a storage locker and my, my initial belief was just get rid of it. You know, it'll be a cost. <laughs> we can get more, like we didn't have particularly nice stuff. Yeah. And uh, we were selling some things on, on eBay before we left and every little thing that I never even really used, I just kept just like, might use it one day. Like my bicycle, I'd, I'd purchased quite a good bicycle before the kid came along and that's been, uh, that's been my savior through all this and um two couches because we got we moved into a five bedroom flat wow and um it's a long story <laughs> <laughs> but it's in the countryside though too it's in it's in the nicest village in england like three years running it's been elected that man so. you really got a good you're in a great spot right now that's i mean i'm yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to jinx it, but <laughs> yeah, it's <that's> good. <laughs> that's awesome, man. That's that's so great. So, how do you how do you think the UK is sort of responding to this whole thing? I mean, you you get did you get a taste of it in Canada before you left, or was it already sort of started once you came back? Um, I mean, you started to realize things were getting heavy when they shut the sports down. Mm. It was like, okay, this is not, you know. You you can't now tell yourself that the conspiracy theories you've read on the internet might be true. It's like, no, they don't shut those down for no reason. Well, especially, yeah. I, and, like, this was a really, like, monumental year for uh, football in the UK, too, right? Like, there was a team that, like, had been, like, trying to win forever and is now finally actually, like, was just about to, like, make it, like, to go right to the end. And it was, yeah, I, I've been hearing yeah. that crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah, well, just, yeah, everything. Um, uh, but England was, was actually trying, they were, they were under the impression that it's not um, that big of a deal. And their fearless leader, Boris Johnson, <laughs> said, well, you know, we'll get herd immunity. He's now, he's going to die. I'm sure of it. <laughs> because he's gone. Yeah. Well, they won't, like, there's, He's in the hospital right now. He oh has my it. God. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, he's had it for 10 days and he just went to the hospital, but everybody's like going, he's fine, he's fine. He can <laughs> still 
leave the government? Because that's where you'd go in the middle of a pandemic oh, to yeah. a hospital yeah. to take up a bed. Jeez. And and, uh, and the one thing, like, no one's, they say he's still running the government, but um, they also said, the guy who did the press conference today said he hadn't talked to him since Saturday, or he hadn't talked to him since Friday. Wow. So, He's really, I, th I think he's on a ventilator. And that's the thing about this virus. Um, it's not, there's, there's, there's a couple of different strains and you can get a viral load. Like if you get, you can get like a combined Corona virus that's stronger. Because yeah. Boris Johnson was at a hospital when he didn't think it was a big deal. He's like, I shook hands with the patients. I, they're fine. We're all going to be fine. And now <laughs> that strain has knocked out about four of his big cabinet members. Jeez. So he might have shook hand. He might have brought a killer virus all the way into his party. It's not funny. It's no. not. It's not funny that these guys who wouldn't fund health care are not dying of a killer virus. <laughs> we don't, we, I don't think it's funny. No. No. Gosh. No. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I do think. One of the things that I find really interesting, and especially in the United States, is that um, I think like we were heading sort of up into this crazy thing where the like the left and the right were separated, and everybody was sort of fighting. And, and this this seems to be like the big sort of like flat line uh, for everybody, where it's just like, hey, it doesn't matter who you are or what you believe, like we're all susceptible to this thing. And and I think that people are realizing that like got lying from the government isn't working, and like there's just like there's there's nothing anybody can do and it's been interesting because i feel like it's sort of putting everybody on the same plane right now which is i think my, it, it, i mean maybe on the other side of this it's a good thing yeah yeah i mean trump trump has been exposed but his, his supporters are so dumb they don't <laughs> they don't remember what he said like they were just like i think he's done a good job he said he did a good job yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like he's what done, I'm like to do. Yeah. He's done terribly, and the only thing that he's done correctly is to apply, like what Bernie Sanders would have done. When okay, cut everybody a check, and we'll we'll pump this, uh, we'll pump this up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything else he's done has has failed miserably, and now he's. Um, He's, he's, he's trying to hog um, masks for some uh, reason. Well, yeah, and, like, cut off the country that, like, helps supply them, like, cutting off Canada, like, that's, that's not yeah, a good thing. Yeah, yeah, well, even Trudeau, who's very pragmatic. I mean, I like him, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, I, the, well, I mean, he's taken, he, he did so well when it came because he took it seriously. And when Sophie got it, he self-isolated. He was doing all those press conferences from his front step, yeah. speaking very evenly. I almost forgot about the blacking up. I almost... <laughs> Just so close. So almost. Yeah, like for the time that he used to speak, I was like, that's the blacked up guy. Like I, I <laughs> genuinely listened to him. But, I mean, he's in isolation, so who knows what he's doing that 23 and a half <laughs> other hours of the day. He's got it all. He's, he's, he's just he's making his way. It's a whole multicultural landscape at home. He's just, he's trying, he's trying a little bit of this, a little bit of that. <laughs> yeah, you guarantee he's touching his face as just he applies. Like full palette, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was especially offensive when he portrayed it when he did the Chinese version. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh, I mean, look, pre-coronavirus, who who's to say? But I think right now that's it's not the time. <laughs> or very much so, you know. Maybe the, maybe it's off the table now. <laughs> 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 just start sucking down pangolins at such a rate that the world has to be shut down. Maybe you do get a little bit. Maybe, maybe. Um, <laughs> you've been you've been home for obviously not a super long time right now. But how has uh, have you noticed like the comedy community in the UK? Sort of how are they responding? And do you find that like because I see in like the West Coast and LA and things like that, they've been doing sort of like online shows and things like that. Are they doing something similar there? 
Yeah, I've done a few. I've done a few. What I would say about online shows, um, the for the ones that I've done, it's a lot better if you pre-record something and they play that. Because I've done. I did one that was live and I, there was no reason for it to be live. Yeah. Uh, and it just turned into a bunch of comics who'd been day drinking and <laughs> ended up on Zoom looking into each other's houses like, hey, what do you, what's in your fridge? <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, but it's... It's been good, and I don't think the full lockdown's going to last. Um, I think the full lockdown will be two months, and everything will be back to normal in six. And, yeah, um, I sure so. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've learned how to edit on my iMovie. I'm not great at it. Yeah. But, hey, that's good. You know, I'm taking... I got an idea for a book, but I, it's weird. I'd, I'd had the idea before. And it, it's almost like it's almost like this whole thing has been has been like like like, pro, like every excuse I've ever made in my head for not doing it is just Don't been valid swept now. aside. Going, yeah. yeah, okay, but I work too much. Okay, nope. Well, no, That's you don't. Yeah. yeah, but I want to watch the game. Okay, well, we'll take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is the really the the ultimate uh, uh uh excuse breaker i could i i've had the same thing yeah it's there's a I've, i spent the whole weekend uh this weekend like oiling up the hinges on doors and like fixing things that i probably should have like two years ago so <laughs> yeah i i have found that tasks um people fight over them in the house now like <laughs> no I, i'm the one who does that it's weird that your child that was that was an impression of your child <laughs> he's very grown up i'm doing the plumbing <laughs> um so I, I do you think that like i've seen a little bit of like the late night shows doing it like do you do you think that like their comedy serves a purpose during like times like this like do you think it's important that comedy addresses it or like distracts from it uh, I do, and uh, the one plus of uh, this um, is when the world starts up again, I don't think anybody's going to want to hear about this, comedically. They're, they're going to be sick to death of it. They're definitely wanna, not going to want to pay to see a show about it. Yeah. You can, you, you'll be able to maybe do a few jokes off the top just to honor what everybody's gone through. Yeah. So... Um, right now, the tweets and the posts and the and the videos about it are really important because um, it is helping people get through. Um, it's it's keeping it's keeping your instrument uh, in tune, so to speak, uh, and also it's it's stuff that you'll never be able to use again. So, I would say to um, any any comic out there or or um, uh, com you know, you don't have to be a comedian, but this, you, I, I wouldn't take this time off. This is, this is absolutely the time to be tweeting too much, to be posting too much, to be putting too many things on the internet, because you'll either have nobody see it, and then nobody saw it, yeah. <laughs> or you'll bring a lot of joy to a lot of people, and uh, they need that right now. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that they're super valuable. Though I, I don't think I ever need to hear another cancel culture joke about the coronavirus. I think that's, that's been played out at this point. I think every comedian for the first like three weeks was just like, I've got a good funny idea. Cancel culture, things are getting canceled. Uh, I think I got a joke here. <laughs> that I'm okay with no more of, but no, I think it's I think th this is the point now, like like though there's we there's too many of them create your podcast like do like create the art that, that 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 can like work beyond this thing but like now is a chance to like put the work in to make those things happen because i think that's the, one of the biggest challenges for a lot of comedians it's like oh i have all these really cool ideas but i never have the time to put the work into it it's like now there's no excuse like put the work in now and so you can yeah put one finger on the other side of things and and even if the output you do right now isn't very good um you're getting good by doing it a hundred percent i think that that's the biggest thing that you can do right now is just like try something i, I think like because one there's an audience out there like 
now's the time to try to get an audience because no one's doing anything else except for sitting on their phone or their computer. So it's like, do something and just put it out there and you'll get some feedback in some way or another. Like people are ready yeah. to like consume and probably are more willing to be like uh, consuming something and being nicer about it because it's like, they're just looking for shit to do right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think in the end, this will be a positive because uh, people will respect being out more they'll respect that, you know, we kind of got complacent. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we didn't we didn't honor perform, performance as much as we should have you know but i would love i would go see a concert of fucking anything right now like yeah. if you, you know, a choir i'd love it yeah. absolutely anything i would be there you give me your mumford and sons you give me your electronic music you uh, give me it all i'll do it i'll see it <laughs> Do you know, I have a friend who um, was offered to um, open for, he's a comedian, and he was offered to open for Mumford and Sons oh. for, uh, I think, like a, like their whole European tour or something. That's a bad idea. And I asked, he told me, and I said, "What did you do it? And he went, no, in the end, I thought about it. But I didn't do it because I just assumed through a whole tour, if I open for them every night, there's a slim chance I might have had to listen to one of their songs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. I mean, usually, usually the issue is like, don't do comedy before music because they <laughs> shit about comedy. But... I, <laughs> That's a whole other perspective. I, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even thought about it. You'd have to listen to the music, unfortunately. I mean, at least yeah. once. Like, just running off the stage. One of the days they're going to start early. Like, yeah, there's no... <laughs> <laughs> they might be playing it in the crowd as the people come in. Yeah, you don't... Yeah, yeah. It's uh, too big of a risk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I so, remember I got... My, when I was more focused in america i got offered to um to open and it was gonna be for a long tour for portugal the man oh wow i mean almost that might be the one band that almost could work well i was so out of the loop i was like is it in portugal and am i opening <laughs> for the man <laughs> <laughs> How is the entire country of Portugal playing music? I don't, I don't yeah, know. that doesn't make any sense. God, this is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. I, but I've since heard them and thought they are actually quite good. I wish yeah, I wish I think they're weird enough that I think that that's the they're, 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 there's a scale, right? The band needs to be weird enough that comedy could and comedy is almost incorporated into what they do to maybe make that work. I think that may be the one chance to be able to do yeah. with comedy. Well, there's a fantastic comedian here in uh, England named Boothby Grafo. Um, just, just fully a funny man. Like, like there's, there's no time Boothby's not funny. Yeah. Um, I mean, with a name like that, and, that's all. Yeah, hilarious. well, it's not his real name. <laughs> Boothby Grafo is the name of a town that he traveled through once, but that's uh, it's his stage name. But he, uh, he opens for the Bare Naked Ladies. Uh, Every time they come to uh, yeah, England. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, but he's he's musical comedy too, and I think he gets, I think he's almost in the band now. Like that's how wow. much they love him. So. Oh, wow. that's awesome. That's that's yeah. great. Well, they have a slot available. <laughs> You've had that available for a while, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you see? Did you see when they reunited for the Junos? Yes, and uh, Stephen Page sang the line, "When I had a million dollars." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you seen that commercial? He the the crap the new crap dinner commercial. I did, I did. I thought it was strong. That was good. That's I was cool. like, heck, yeah, doing like a uh, doing that sort of joke. I think it's worth it. But yeah, it's funny. I listened to some interviews at, with Stephen Page after that event, and they were like, oh, "So you guys get it?" And he's like, "No, no." <laughs> like, <laughs> this was enough like <laughs> yeah well i remember i flew into cleveland once a day early i was doing a club there 
And because I was coming from Europe, I went in the day early. And this is when I was just living on the road. I was just going from club to club. Yeah. And um, I, I was, yeah, like it's quite a, quite a lonely life. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a big music venue right next to the hotel. And uh, it's just like one night only, Stephen Page. And I just didn't know what that guy's name was. <laughs> I was <laughs> like, oh, I don't think I'd enjoy that. Just I'm not just going to go risk it. Some dude named Stephen Page? Okay. <laughs> and, yeah, he's got he's to be, he's got to do more like voice of the bare naked. <laughs> you know? That's right, yeah, yeah. Like just BNL dash Stephen Page, I think that would even help. I think, like, yeah, he promises to sing Brian Wilson at the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm in. Oh my god, that's amazing. Um, so I've got some sort of like generic like comedy questions I've been asking everybody. So I'm gonna just jump into a few of those now. No problem. Um, maybe can you tell us some comedic actors or comedians like uh, before you got into comedy and then once you got into comedy, like how and how those have changed and sort of like who you're really like uh, sort of admiring now and sort of who was before you sort of got into comedy? Uh, I really like George Carlin. Uh, I had uh, had all his albums and I think it's just uh, just regular stuff. George Carlin, Richard Pryor, you know, Steve Martin, anything that anything that was on vinyl and and you know, um, the uh, the dirty little secret of all of uh, Generation X when we were we all loved Eddie Murphy that you know yeah. people are like now it's it's basically a hate crime what he's doing <laughs> and it is it is and it was but we loved it yeah. like yeah, it's, it's like Mike Tyson everybody's like well I don't even see why he's famous anymore because he was the most famous man on the yeah. planet. <laughs> it, anytime Tyson fought, it was the biggest thing. Like people you didn't even know, like bar, like everybody had an opinion on Mike Tyson. Yeah. Everybody had an opinion on the way he fought. Like there's no getting around it. Yeah. He was the most True. famous man on the planet, mm-hmm. and um, arguably uh, more interesting than uh, than all the athletes of his time. Like he's he, he's uh, anyway. I could get off into a big tangent about Mike Tyson, but I won't. Um, comics I like now, I mean, I don't, I don't dislike anybody. I mean, I've, I've got some real great friends in the in the business. Sure. I don't, I don't really watch a lot anymore, though, just because I'm getting older too. And if if you spend an hour. If you, if you spend many hours a week watching comedy, every time you write a fit, you'll be like, uh, did I write that? Did I think that? That is a problem, <laughs> yeah. And that's a thing that I've definitely heard from a lot of performers, too, where it's like, that, that's a concern you need to be aware of. It's just like, I, I don't want that, like, in, coming into my brain even, that it's even a question if I if do it on purpose, right? So Yeah. Without a doubt. Um, what about sort of, like, people that maybe, like, not a lot of people know about right now, but that you've been sort of like, maybe you've gotten to do, do some shows with that you're like, oh, that person's really cool to look up for. Uh, a couple of guys in Vancouver caught my eye when I was back. Yeah. Justin Nickel, Ryan Williams. There's some real, real good uh, young comics coming out of there. But Vancouver has always been, a, always been a producer, you know. Um, even, uh, even when I started the, uh, the lineup card, for my first amateur night, I think four of the comics went on to international wow. success. Yeah, like, let me think. Pete Johansson was on it. Uh, Campbell had already gone. But uh, Ian Bag, Kelly Dixon, uh, Tom Stade was hosting. Um, and a, a few other people here or there, but like for an amateur night lineup, if one of the people ends up getting middle money in clubs, you're like, well, that's, you know, <laughs> like, I feel. I said, yeah, yeah. 
Absolutely. And, uh, and all okay. yeah, and Jan Johnny Bagpipes Johnson was uh, was headlining the whole thing. <laughs> I would have. Yeah, yeah. He didn't join. Uh, well, Johnny did, did end up doing some international stuff, but the, I mean, he could tear a room apart, and and I, I assume still is. Um, yeah. So you work with all these people that have. Um, I and I think it helped because I just went on stage. I mean, the first show I ever saw, I was like, "Oh, you've got to be really good to do this." <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, how have you seen like comedy change since you got into it? Like, is do, do you think that like it's always sort of the same, or do you see like writings changing, or like the audiences are changing a lot? Uh, I think. Um, it, well, from Vancouver, from a Vancouver point of view, where I started, it was always quite sensitive and um, politically correct, and yeah. people almost looking to be offended, yeah. which has set me the that's set me up quite well in the, in the way that the world is. Well, yeah, shifted. But again, I think that's all going to um, that's all going to go by the wayside once the world restarts because. Um, that seemed to me like a, a reflex of boredom, you know? Yeah. Where we fight, where we were having comedy shows that didn't have to be funny as long as they're making a point. And it's like, I, I just don't have that luxury. Like if I go out, if I go out to laugh, I've come out to laugh and, um, yeah. you know, and I, I don't, I don't begrudge anybody making a buck off of it. Uh, I, <laughs> It bothers me when those shows are like, you know, like I'm not like those comics that that get people to. I'm not one of those comics that makes everyone laugh in the room. They compare themselves, or they like try to like separate themselves by like sort of creating that juxtaposition where it doesn't need to exist. Like, just do your own thing. Like, you don't need to do it in spite of someone else. Yeah, yeah, and uh, a lot of the times, like. Um, they're like, you know, these shouting white men, and I'm like, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't, I, I've not made fun of you at all. <laughs> you, know, you, can, you can stand up for good things without putting down a group of other people, right? I think that's yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, and um, yeah, it it doesn't make sense to me, but um, I I truly believe once this is over nobody's going to have time to be offended by a night anymore. They're just going to be over the moon that they're not staring yeah, at their children. Other people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's going to be a huge one. Do you think that any topics like uh, uh, should be off limits in comedy or do you think everything's fair? No, no. no, I don't. Um, but I think, um, I mean, I know for myself, I'm getting older and there's just, there's problems I don't want anymore. But as a 45 year old man, my comedy I, and my, my standpoint should have uh, matured to an extent that, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going for laughs in that area. Yeah. But what bothers me is that, um, or what concerns me is that uh, the youngsters are being um, invited not to take a risk and uh, I, I think yeah. that's that's a mistake uh, I think there's a there's sort of a punk aspect of a of a young guy or girl I mean you know just oh, just yeah. uh, you know just just speak in their mind totally yeah. inappropriately and I think it's powerful and I, I, I don't think that they should be discouraged from doing it no, and it's interesting, though, because it is something I am seeing a bit more with women is that women are getting more into sort of that type of comedy now, which is like a larger amount of like the, these the comedians that I book. It's a lot of the time the women are the ones now who are being the more offensive comedians. And I kind of love that. I think it's great. I, I think that's awesome. It, oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. Just but... Less men doing it, more women doing it. I'm totally fine with that. As long as that as long as like subversive comedy exists, I think it doesn't matter who it's coming from and like give somebody else who like wasn't able to before a chance. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the, um, the point that gets lost, um, when 
when we strive for diversity is that when you're doing it, when you actually are doing it consciously, yeah. you're you're defeating the the purpose of it. And and real comedy is spaceless. It's genderless. It's just about a concept uh, that everybody listens to and says that's funny. And it it is it is funny to me when when the the idea that uh, diversity needs to be portrayed within comedy because in essence i've never seen a crowd care who said it if it's funny just a matter of if it's, it's funny right yeah it's a thing that i struggle with booking the comedy festival up here is it's i want to have different perspectives i think mean, different perspectives is the number one thing that i'm looking for diversity comes from that but i think it's it can be really challenging because you want to i mean there's so many factors right you need to book you need to be able to like afford the people you need to be able to have them be available they need to be able to want to come to a remote location uh and then they need to have a different perspective and actually be funny most importantly and i, and I think that having all of those things you want to be able to have a diverse lineup but you don't want to ever book based on that like the thing that i always tell people is that like i never want to check off a, a box yeah I think that like there shouldn't be the like I, I need to get uh, uh, an LGBT one and a black one. I, I never ever want to do that. I think it's just yeah, like, yeah. But finding unique, but but at the same time, I want to make sure that I have different perspectives. And so it's, I think it's like a balance of like weighing out like who's talking from a, a, a viewpoint that maybe that doesn't spe speak to me, but not at the same time not looking at sort of like who they are as a person. It's a, it's a really hard sort of tightrope to walk, but I think it's important to be able to do it but never book someone because it's like, oh, this is the one blank that does comedy. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, um, in the, uh, there has been a, a tendency uh, with the younger comics to look at lineups and go, oh, well, I mean, that's, there's, there's not enough diversity in there. That's just, there's one thing, but what they don't consider is that whoever booked that lineup very possibly that that wasn't they those weren't the first people that they reached out to those yeah. are the people that said they would do it well that's a whole other component too right i mean that's a, a, we uh, like i've definitely taken heat for not booking like a, a diverse enough of a lineup before and and the thing for me it's it's you, you can't go on the defensive because it never works out but uh, i think i i also am going you don't realize how many like saying no's to that I've heard like how many people have got like no I've got like I'm the one comedian that does this type of comedy and I'm booked non-stop all the time and it's like okay well it, it becomes like how do I how do I whittle that down without paying too much money it's like it's not an easy thing for sure and there's a there's un, the, the, the unfortunate fact of it is there's just a lot more white male comedians uh, with, with, that's just what it, what is there but I don't think they they should be discounted. If anything, I think now we now it's a time for for white male comedians to be able to like up your game because you got a lot of competition, right? So I think that's that's not a bad well, thing. Well, and and that's that's what it leads to um, the uh, in in comedy to an extent. The harder you make the road, the better you make the comedian. So Absolutely. when people people say to you, they go, "Oh, well, you should you should book all these people that haven't really paid their dues," and it's like, "Yeah, well." I could, but then I'd actually be hurting their careers in the long run because they didn't work as hard to get it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, sort of as we're sort of taking this in for a landing, uh, in your comedy career up to this point, can you think of any memorable moments where you specifically felt success? Like, uh, I know for comedians, it's challenging sometimes to talk about sort of the their idea of success and where they see success in their career, but. Um, whether it's like an opportunity you were given, a person you met, or even just a joke you were finally able to make work, like is there an idea, is there moments that come to your head when you think about like moments that were significant like success for you during your career? Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> the one that my parents understood was, um, was quite nice. I was in uh, San Francisco, there was a, um, I was playing a club in Sunnyvale, uh, and they, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the Will Durst. Will Durst puts on a thing in the park in San Francisco every year. Um, it's a free comedy show, 
every year the special guest is Robin Williams. Wow. Every year it's supposed to be a secret. It's supposed to be a secret, but everybody knows Robin Williams will be performing because I'm playing the club, and I know Durst from um, Edinburgh. I'd seen, I, I, you know, we 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 hung out a few times. Yeah. He got a hold of me. So you want to come down? Sure. It was in the afternoon. That's pretty cool. A big marquee, big yeah. big uh, big stage, and I'm backstage getting, um, you know, I'm I'm in the buffet waiting in line and uh, with all these other comics, Rob Williams shows up, the line just empties. Now I'm standing there like, hey, yeah, I thought I was gonna have to wait a long time. So I put a chimichanga on my plate and I'm just like, I don't care about Rob Williams, Mork and Mindy, who gives, I'm just, nothing to me, man. And Robin Williams, like all these comic crowd around trying to make conversation, and he pointed over them and he went, Glenn Wolf. Holy You're shit. a very funny man. And he, <laughs> broke through, he broke through the crowd. And because it was during the day, I had my sunglasses on. So sadly, he's not with us anymore. But like, he must have thought I was the coolest cat because my eyes were wide open. <laughs> And I was just holding, but I was wearing sunglasses. I'm holding yeah. this burning chimichanga through the <laughs> paper. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. He, he, um, he'd seen a thing I did on TV. And he was quoting it back to me. Like, he wow. was that. Yeah. So, I mean, we've got a few mutual friends. And I spoke about them and to him. But he kept trying to make me joke around like uh -oh. he was just a just a playful spirit and um one of the one of the nicest guys that you could imagine in that situation and um and i just sort of he goes like oh i gotta get out of here but uh, hey great to meet you i love you here and he goes off so i send my mom and dad an email later that day going you guys aren't gonna believe it like they took me to rob williams movies when yeah, i was a kid uh i wrote my mom an email rob i told her the whole story yeah and uh so my mom reads the email out to my dad and um there's this lady that used to come help my mom clean the house named mina um and she just happened to be there at that day and my mom read the email out to my dad and said, can you imagine that? Ron Williams knows who our son is. And Mina went, oh, Robin? He's a wonderful man. She, she knew him. Wow. <laughs> she, yeah, she, he had, because she was from Terrace originally, and he'd filmed a movie up there. And... Um, yeah, everybody in town, everybody in Terrace apparently knows Rob Williams because he would, you know, stay late in restaurants and oh. play games. And yeah, he was just a wonderful dude. Yeah, we missed yeah. it. We, we, we lost a good guy. Jeez. Yeah, we really did. Unreal. Really did. Um, so sort of our last sort of question uh, for today. Uh, do you have any tips for surviving right now? Like uh, things that you're doing to kind of help keep your sanity. I know that I like to ask comedians this because there's nobody who understands like uh, depression, <laughs> isolation. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might have a good idea. To be fair, it's like five o'clock or six o'clock there, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> You were just lying. You're actually back at the end. <laughs> you take with that whatever you want. But this is the only way. This is the only way. This is the only way. I see you You kept your sanity. It's wonderful to see. Yeah. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you so much, God. I really appreciate that. You too, and uh, I appreciate you talking to me, and uh, White Horse Yukon, I am your lost tribe. <laughs> I cannot, I cannot believe okay, we didn't get to, uh, 
reunify and uh, I look ver very forward to being able to come back and see you. Tikini because, uh, Elementary Massive. That's right, yes, yes. We're 100% getting you back here. Um, uh, can you just give some places where people can find your stuff online, uh, social media, all that stuff? Uh, yeah, I got a Twitter account uh, at Glenn Wall. Two ends in Glenn, though, remember that. And a uh, Facebook fan page. I should be getting my YouTube page up and running. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, if I don't during this lockdown, then it's not happening. <laughs> it's just never going to do it. Now's the chance. And Instagram too. Instagram. I got a game late to the party there, so my followers are not large. <laughs> you got a solid Instagram. I did. It's a good follow for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks so much, Glenn. I appreciate you. Uh, enjoy. I, the birds are chirping behind you. I, it sounds like you've got mm. a great day ahead of you. So. Well, I'm behind me now. <laughs> yes. It's all. It's on to the gin now. <laughs> it's a good idea. <laughs> Eleven's not too early, right? Anyways, I'll, not uh, you, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. I'll talk to you later. You too. Later. Bye.